From the Queen's golden boy to accused child predator, Prince Andrew has run the full gamut of public opinion. This is Prince Andrew's complete transformation. We've all heard the expression, an heir and a spare. So why did Queen Elizabeth choose to have more children after she gave birth to both Prince Charles and Princess Anne? As explained by historian Robert Lacey, Elizabeth doesn't have a particularly close relationship with her first son, Charles. This is largely because she spent the bulk of his childhood serving as the monarch of her country. Q. Andrew, who was born 12 years after Charles and who served as a sort of do-over for the Queen. He was born in 1960, and as the Queen had gotten her footing as monarch by that time, she was, according to Lacey, warmer and more flexible. Historian Lacey told Town & Country, Early in the 1960s, Her Majesty decided that she had done her duty by her country and took the best part of 18 months off work to produce and enjoy her second family, the young princes Andrew and Edward, born in 1960 and 1964 respectively. What's more is that in the 1960s, Elizabeth and Prince Philip gave the BBC permission to follow them with cameras for a documentary. Lacey explained, Some of the footage showed Elizabeth as a playful mother relaxing with her children. To say that Andrew had a completely different childhood experience to that of his eldest siblings is an understatement. Young Prince Andrew had both academic and professional pursuits. Much like the royals who came before him, he was educated by a governess while he lived in Buckingham Palace until he was about eight years old. As a young teen, he moved to Scotland and attended the Gordonston School. This is the same boarding school that had been home to both his father, Prince Philip, and his older brother, Prince Charles. From there, Andrew moved once again, this time to attend the Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth, Devon, England. It was through his final schooling experience that Andrew settled on joining the Royal Navy, where he served as an officer and pilot for a number of years. In the early 1980s, he was stationed on the HMS Invincible. From there, he flew a variety of missions that resulted in casualty evacuation from the British-held territory, the Falkland Islands. In 1984, two years after his service on the front lines, Queen Elizabeth named him a, quote, personal aide-de-camp and promoted him to the rank of lieutenant. In Netflix's The Crown, there is an exchange between Olivia Colman's Queen Elizabeth and James Murray's Prince Andrew, which speaks volumes about a relationship that the prince had in the early 80s. The scene in question depicts Andrew speaking about his then-girlfriend, Koo Stark, who, in 1976, starred in a film about an underaged girl dealing with older sexual predators called The Awakening of Emily. Of course, the scene is an allusion to Andrew's involvement with Jeffrey Epstein, but it also shed light on the relationship the prince shared with the actress. And yes, the film, which follows a 17-year-old who is taken advantage of sexually while visiting home from boarding school, is very much real. Stark was four years older than Andrew when they met in 1981, and the pair had called off their relationship in 1983. Stark told the Mail Today, "...the amount of attention and pressure on me became unbearable." Prince Andrew tied the knot with Sarah Fergie Ferguson three years after his break with Stark in 1986. Royal weddings are a huge deal, and Andrew's wedding came as a huge celebratory affair in Britain. As noted by the BBC, Andrew and Fergie said I do on July 23, 1986, in front of 2,000 wedding guests lining the aisle at Westminster Abbey. Thousands of people crowded the streets to get a peek at the royal couple, and 500 million watched as the two became husband and wife. Fergie had a four-minute-long walk down the aisle, and if that wasn't nerve-wracking enough, she had to carry a 17-foot-long train behind her. The then First Lady of the United States, Nancy Reagan, was in attendance, as was Margaret Thatcher. In addition, 17 members of royal families from around the world were also there. Just before Andrew and Fergie were officially married, they adopted the titles the Duke and Duchess of York, bestowed upon them by Queen Elizabeth. Shortly after he became a husband, Prince Andrew became a father. 
He and Sarah Ferguson welcomed Princess Beatrice on August 8, 1988 at the Portland Hospital in London. Andrew's first daughter had a bit of a rough childhood, as she struggled with dyslexia in addition to dealing with her parents' divorce. Two years later, Andrew and Fergie welcomed Princess Eugenie at the same hospital where Beatrice was born. According to the Los Angeles Times at the time, the couple appeared on the steps of the hospital with a swaddled baby Eugenie. The newspaper noted how she slept like a baby throughout the intense media attention. When we think about Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson, the word whirlwind comes to mind. Their courtship was quick, they were only married for two years before they welcomed children, and by the early 1990s, their marriage had begun to deteriorate. The two were legally separated by 1992. According to Fergie, Andrew's role in the Royal Navy made maintaining their relationship incredibly difficult. He was only able to see her 40 out of the 365 days per year for the first five years of their marriage. Fergie told Harper's Bazaar, I spent my entire first pregnancy alone. When Beatrice was born, Andrew got 10 days of shore leave, and when he left and I cried, they all said, grow up and get a grip. Then, in 1992, the Washington Post reported on Fergie's infamous toe-sucking scandal, which involved paparazzi photos taken of Fergie and then-lover John Bryan. The photos pictured Bryan, quote, "...planting a tender kiss on the sole of the Duchess's foot." After this, reconciliation was never in the cards for Andrew and Fergie. About four years after separating, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson divorced. Andrew got through to the other side of the debacle rather unscathed, as the media attention at the time largely focused on Fergie and the rumblings of infidelity. The royal family, and Prince Philip in particular, was deeply scarred by the divorce. And it most likely did not help that other royal marriages were crumbling at the time. Prince Charles and Diana Spencer were also divorcing, and Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips had ended their marriage shortly before as well. Philip reportedly said in private, "...everything I have worked for for 40 years has been in vain." In the 1990s, while plagued by his divorce, Prince Andrew also used the time to try to emerge as a businessman. As noted by the New York Post, Queen Elizabeth's third child tried to build a career officially representing Britain's business interests abroad. Andrew did so by taking on the role of a trade ambassador. But Andrew's taste in trade led him down a path to the, quote, "...wealthy and insidious members of the international trading community." For instance, Andrew rubbed shoulders with the likes of Saif al-Islam, who happened to be the son of Colonel Gaddafi, the dictator of Libya who faced charges of crimes against humanity. One inside source told royal expert Nigel Cawthorn, "...Andrew's relations around the world are dicey. He's rude, lashes out to lay down the law, and it's so difficult to sell him." If the 1990s were a trying time for Prince Andrew, the early 2000s were a time of darker scandal. As reported by BBC News, sex trafficking victim Virginia Jufri claimed that Andrew sexually abused her in 2001 on three separate occasions. She had been just 16 at the time. Jufri shared that in 2001, the abuse took place at a London nightclub. Infamous billionaire Jeffrey Epstein and his girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, allegedly introduced Jufri to Andrew. Jufri claimed that Maxwell told her, "...I had to do for Andrew what I do for Jeffrey." Andrew allegedly had sex with the teenager later that evening at Maxwell's home. Jufri claims the second abusive interaction allegedly took place in Epstein's New York mansion, and the third occurred on Epstein's private island. Jufri recounted that, at the time, "...I was forced into sex by explicit or implicit threats." She also claims that she feared for her well-being due to Epstein, Maxwell, and the prince's, quote, "...powerful connections, wealth, and authority." Her claims go even further to say that, at the time, Andrew knew she was underaged and a victim of sex trafficking. The allegations against Prince Andrew officially came to light in 2019. While the assaults in question had taken place years prior, Virginia Jufri came forward with her story and pushed the prince into addressing the controversial accusations. In an interview with BBC News, Andrew maintained his innocence and claimed that, while he was associated with Jeffrey Epstein, it was, quote, "...a considerable stretch to categorize their relationship as one of close friendship." But Andrew described Epstein's allure by saying, "...he had the most extraordinary 
um, ability to bring um, uh, extraordinary people together. Uh, and that's the bit that I remember. Andrew maintains that he did not abuse Jufri, nor was he aware of any illegal activity on the part of Epstein or Ghislaine Maxwell, saying, At the time, there was no indication to me or anybody else that that was what he was doing. At this point in history, we've seen Prince Andrew transform from the son of a monarch whose drama was contained to a messy divorce to a named abuser in a civil lawsuit. Virginia Jufri filed a lawsuit in New York under the state's Child Victims Act. This is a law that passed in 2019 enabling child victims of sex trafficking and abuse to come forward and pursue legal avenues for monetary compensation. While the amount of money Jufri is suing Andrew for is unknown, Queen Elizabeth's son has not returned to the U.S. and has maintained that the allegations against him are false. But as Time noted, he has not been able to explain a photo taken of himself and Jufri, who was 17 at the time. Andrew did admit he was served on September 21, 2021, and was given a month to formally respond to the filing. The prince, father of two and grandfather, is expected to face trial any time between September and December 2022. Many people were shocked by the troubling news regarding Prince Andrew, but it's safe to say that observers were even more surprised when his ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson, stood by him. In an interview with People, Fergie divulged that she is in her ex-husband's corner and that she will support him no matter what. She said, "...whatever challenges he has, I will stand firm to the co-parenters that we are together. I believe that he's a kind, good man and he's been a fabulous father to the girls. What's more is that Andrew and Fergie still live together, despite having been divorced for many years." They both reside at Royal Lodge in Windsor and even bought a ski chalet together in 2014. And while Fergie is firmly a member of Team Andrew, his daughters, Princess Beatrice and Princess Eugenie, reportedly haven't had an easy time with the allegations posed against their father. A friend of the princesses told the New York Post that the two were, quote, "...deeply distressed over the news, but that they still support their father." Andrew is the royal with the lowest approval rating, but despite the disturbing allegations attached to him and his withdrawal from the public eye, Andrew is still rumored to be the Queen's favorite child, which, according to The Independent, the Queen is often frustrated with Charles. According to royal expert Clive Irvine, she is said to be, quote, "...openly affectionate with Andrew." As far as Irvine shared, Elizabeth does not think Charles will ever, quote, "...live up to her sense of duty." However, as Andrew will almost certainly never be king, such pressure does not fall on him. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673.